Hey, this is Running With Dapa, day 10. I'm indoors. Outside is cold. Outside is night. And um, I can't run. So, well, I can, but I prefer to run indoors. I got this thing, like a walking pad thing. I wonder if I'm going to show here. Walking pad, check out the fit at the same time. Jamaica pants. Same basketball shoes I always wear now. And this shirt I got in 2018 when I went to a conference in in 2018 um, at San Francisco, a tech conference. It was called F8 Developer Conference. It was very cool. So this walker thing is decent. Let's see how well it does. First time I'm using my big shoes on it. And I'm going to go do max speed. I don't know if I can do 30, 20. If I can do um, how fast we usually go? I usually go four miles per hour. But remember, this is not about being quick. This is about having a decent heart rate. All right. So that's what we're doing. And today we're going to listen or watch a YouTube video at the same time because. Right now, I have very low energy. Today, I went into work for the first time in a while. Um, I went out there and thing, work and thing came in. I was in a little bit of a rough, a little of space, but not rough space, but I just my body not feel as smooth as it was the last week or the week before. But this is a well, the third week I'm doing this now, first day, Monday. So we're here. And we're gonna watch a we're gonna listen to a little video about um singer Alex Net talking about some good things. But we're here. And we're running and we're not stopping. And we're pushing. I think I'm gonna stop in a 30 minutes. Pause and then maybe do another 30. You see. It was published in 2012 in an eight-page paper that shocked the computer vision community by showing that an old AI idea would work unbelievably well when scaled. The paper's second author, Ilya Sutskever, would go on to co-found OpenAI, where he and the OpenAI team would massively scale up this idea again to create ChatGPT. This video is sponsored by KiwiCo. More on them later. If you look under the hood of ChatGPT, you won't find any obvious signs of intelligence. Instead, you'll find layer after layer of compute blocks called transformers. This is what the T in GPT stands for. Each transformer performs a set of fixed matrix operations on an input matrix of data, and typically returns an output matrix of the same size. To figure out what it's going to say next, ChatGPT breaks apart what you ask it into words and word fragments, maps each of these to a vector, and stacks all of these vectors together into a matrix. This matrix is then passed into the first transformer block, which returns a new matrix of the same size. This operation is then repeated again and again, 96 times in ChatGPT 3.5 and reportedly 120 times in ChatGPT 4. Now, here's the absurd part. With a few caveats, the next word or word fragment that ChatGPT says back to you is literally just the last column of its final output matrix mapped from a vector back to text. To formulate a full response, this new word or word fragment is appended to the end of the original output, and this new slightly longer text is fed back into the input of ChatGPT. This process is repeated again and again, with one new column added to the input matrix each time, until the model's output returns a special stop word fragment. And that is it. One matrix multiply after another, ChatGPT slowly morphs the input you give it into the output it returns. Where is the intelligence? How is it that these 100 or so blocks of dumb compute are able to write essays, translate language, summarize books, solve math problems, explain complex concepts, or even write the next line of this script? The answer lies in the vast amounts of data these models are trained on. Okay, pretty good, but not quite what I wanted to say next. The AlexNet paper is significant because it marks the first time you really see layers of compute blocks like this learning to do unbelievable things. An 
AI tipping point towards high performance and scale and away from explainability. While ChatGPT is trained to predict the next word fragment given some text, AlexNet is trained to predict a label given an image. The input image to AlexNet is represented as a three-dimensional matrix or tensor of RGB intensity values. And the output is a single vector of length 1000, where each entry corresponds to AlexNet's predicted probability that the input image belongs to one of the 1000 classes in the ImageNet dataset. Things like tabby cats, German shepherds, hot dogs, toasters, and aircraft carriers. Just like ChatGPT today, AlexNet was somehow magically able to map the inputs we give it into the outputs we wanted, using layer after layer of compute block, after training on a large dataset. One nice thing about vision models, however, is that it's easier to poke around under the hood and get some idea of what the model has learned. One of the first under the hood insights that Krzyzewski, Sutskeber, and Hinchin show in the AlexNet paper is that the model has learned some very interesting visual patterns in its first layer. The first five layers of AlexNet are all convolutional blocks, first developed in the late 1980s to classify handwritten digits, and can be understood as a special case of the transformable blocks in ChatGPT and other large language models. In convolutional blocks, the input image tensor is transformed by sliding a much smaller tensor called a kernel of learned weight values across the image, and at each location computing the dot product between the image and kernel. Here, it's helpful to think of the dot product as a similarity score. The more similar a given patch of the image and kernel are, the higher the resulting dot product will be. AlexNet uses 96 individual kernels in its first layer, each of dimension 11 by 11 by 3. So conveniently, we can visualize them as little RGB images. These images give us a nice idea of how the first layer of AlexNet sees the image. The upper kernels in this figure show where AlexNet has clearly learned to detect edges, or rapid changes from light to dark at various angles. Images with similar patterns will generate high dot products with these kernels. Below, we see where AlexNet has learned to detect blobs of various colors. These kernels are all initialized as random numbers, and the patterns we're looking at are completely learned from data. Sliding each of our 96 kernels over the input image and computing the dot product at each location produces a new set of 96 matrices, sometimes called activation maps. Conveniently, we can view these as images as well. The activation maps show us which parts of an image, if any, match a given kernel well. If I hold up something visually similar to a given kernel, we see high activation in that part of the activation map. Notice that it goes away when I rotate the pattern by 90 degrees. The image and kernel are no longer aligned. You can also see various activation maps picking up edges and other low-level features in our image. Of course, finding edges and colored blobs in images is still hugely removed from recognizing complex concepts like German shepherds or aircraft carriers. What's astounding about deep neural networks like AlexNet and ChatGPT is that from here, all we do is repeat the same operation again, just with a different set of learned weights. For AlexNet, this means that these 96 activation maps are stacked together into a tensor that become the input to the exact same type of convolutional compute block the second overall layer in the model. We can make our activations easier to see by removing the values close to zero. Unfortunately, in our second layer, we can't learn much by simply visualizing the weight values and the kernels themselves. The first issue is that we just can't see enough colors. The depth of the kernel has to match the depth of the incoming data. In the first layer of AlexNet, the depth of the incoming data is just three, because the model takes in color images with red, green, and blue color chains. However, since the first layer computes 96 separate activation maps, the computation in the second layer of AlexNet is like processing images with 96 separate color chains. The second factor that makes what's happening in the second layer of AlexNet more difficult to visualize is that the dot products are really taking weighted combinations of the computations in the first layer. We need some way to visualize how the layers are working together. A simple way to see what's going on is to try to find parts of various images that strongly activate the outputs of the second layer. For example, this activation map appears to be putting together edge detectors to form basic corners. Remarkably, as we move deeper into AlexNet, strong activations correspond to higher and higher level concepts. By the time we reach the fifth layer, we have activation maps that respond very strongly to faces and other high level concepts. And what's incredible here is that no one explicitly told AlexNet what a face is. All AlexNet had to learn from were the images and labels in the ImageNet dataset, which does not contain a person or face class. 
AlexNet was able to learn completely on its own, both that faces are important and how to recognize them. To better understand what a given kernel in AlexNet has learned, we can also look at the examples in the training data set that give the highest activation values for that kernel. For our face kernel, not surprisingly, we find examples that contain people. Finally, there's this really interesting technique called feature visualization, where we can generate synthetic images that are optimized to maximize a given activation. These synthetic images give us another way to see what a specific activation layer is looking for. By the time we reach the final layer of AlexNet, 10 minutes done, y'all. We're here. Um, watching a video. It's about some papers that came up about. Like, if you want to know chat GPT and machine learning as a whole, how the different models came to be, or when, like, was the boom of this old technique called conven con what? convolutional neural network, where it was used for classify images and how that led to the rise of um, generative AI. With the breakthrough with the open head with chat GPT. And just talking about how that image classifier work on the road. We get a image and how it maps to become an image that is a high probability to another class of images that you already labeled. So let's say you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Three, four, five, five, six, seven, eight. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and you want to label that. You first manually label a bunch of images. And based on the images that you label, you put it in a data set. Um, at zero, one, zero to nine. And then you test the image that come in by seeing how similar it is to other images that you already tested and labeled. And it uses neural networks to do it. Um, so that's who we're listening to. I'll post the video in the chat if you want to take a look. There's a lot of things underneath it that you need to kind of get a quick refresher on like matrix C's over in grade 10 in Jamaica. Um, and like that products and matrix multiplication and, and probability a little bit of probability not that you need to know much 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 more these guys kind of break it out in a way that I kind of watch it up multiple times a bit to get it fully but basically saying that you have multiple layers within the model and the model is just in this case, a classifier, and the first layer checks edges, um, curves, color changes, etc., and then performs some multiplication on it based on the random assortment of play of you know RGB values. And after that layer is computed, the real result is done over and over and over until they get the probability score that it is assigned to that you already labeled. So, got that so far. I'm gonna talk about generative AI. Yeah, well, it did a bit. I have a start where it talked about, if you add something, what is GPT? It kind of run a similar process of a lot of multiplications or a lot of calculation over and over on itself until it ends up with a terminal value so you see GPT, whatever that mean, come on. Anyways, now listen to the rest. 14 minutes down, and we're inside, we're in the outside. The image has been processed into a vector of length 4096. The final layer performs one last matrix computation on this vector to create a final output vector of length 1000, with one entry for each of the classes in the ImageNet dataset. Krzyzewski, Sutskever, and Hinton noticed that the second-to-last layer vector demonstrated some very interesting properties. 
One way to think about this vector is as a point in 4096 dimensional space. Each image we pass into the model is effectively mapped to a point in this space. All we have to do is just stop one layer early and grab this vector. Just as we can measure the distance between two points in 2D space, we can also measure the distance between points or images in this high dimensional space. Hinton's team ran a simple experiment where they took a test image of the ImageNet dataset, computed its corresponding vector, and then searched for the other images in the ImageNet dataset that were closest, or the nearest neighbors, to the test image in this high dimensional space. Remarkably, the nearest neighbor images showed highly similar concepts to the test images. In figure 4 from the AlexNet paper, we see an example where an elephant test image yields nearest neighbors that are all elephants. What's interesting here, too, is that the pixel values themselves between these images are very different. AlexNet really has learned high-dimensional representations of data where similar concepts are physically close. This high-dimensional space is often called a latent or embedding space. In the years following the AlexNet paper, it was shown that not only distance but directionality in some of these embedding spaces has high representations that are the near or the nearest neighbors to the test image in this high dimensional space. Remarkably, the nearest neighbor images showed highly similar concepts to the test images. In figure 4 from the AlexNet paper, we see an example where an elephant test image yields nearest neighbors that are all elephants. What's interesting here, too, is that the pixel values themselves between these images are very different. AlexNet really has learned high-dimensional representations of data where similar concepts are physically close. This high-dimensional space is often called a latent or embedding space. In the years following the AlexNet paper, it was shown that not only distance but directionality in some of these embedding spaces is meaningful. It was often that images are very different. AlexNet really I keep has learned high-dimensional representations of data where similar concepts are physically close. This high-dimensional space is often called a latent or embedding space. In the years following the AlexNet paper, it was shown that not only distance but directionality in some of these embedding spaces is meaningful. The demos you see where faces are age or gender shifted often work by first mapping an image to a vector in an embedding space, and then literally moving this point in the age or gender direction in that embedding space, and then mapping the modified vector back to an image. Before we get into activation atlases, which give us an amazing way to visualize these embedding spaces, please take a moment to consider if this video's sponsor is something that you or someone in your life would enjoy. I was genuinely really excited to work with this company. They make incredibly thoughtful educational products. And by using the link in the description below, you're really helping me make more of these videos. This video's sponsor is KiwiCo. They make these fun and super well-designed educational crates for kids of all ages. They have nine different monthly subscription lines to choose from, focused on different areas of STEAM. And you can also buy individual crates, which are great for trying out KiwiCo and make amazing gifts. Growing up, I was constantly building. Here I am building a tower outside my house to my second story bedroom. I was obsessed with electronics and would have absolutely loved projects like this pencil sharpener from the Eureka Crate line, which is focused on science and engineering. I really believe that this type of hands-on, self-driven learning is magical. When I really think about my own education, it's the times that I've been fully absorbed in projects like this that I learned the most. And now that I'm a dad, I really want my kids to have the same kind of experiences. KiwiCo really does an amazing job boxing up start-to-finish projects like this. My daughter just got the Panda Crate for fine motor skills. It includes these special crayons specifically designed to help her learn different ways of grasping. You can see her here insisting that she gets to bring them in the car with us. Huge thanks to KiwiCo for sponsoring this video. Use the discount code Welch Labs for 50% off your first month of a subscription. Now, back to Alex and Matt. There's some really amazing work that combines the synthetic images that maximize a given set of activations with a two-dimensional projection or flattening out of the embedding space to make these incredible visualizations called activation atlases. Neighbors on the activation atlas are generally close in the embedding space and show similar concepts the model has learned. We're getting a peek into how deep neural networks organize the visual world. Looking at the synthetic images that most activate neighborhoods of neurons, we can visually walk through the embedding space of the model, seeing it make smooth visual transitions from concepts like zebras to tigers to leopards to rabbits. Moving to the middle layers of the model, we can see less fully formed but still meaningful concepts. Moving along this path amazingly correlates with the number and size of pieces of fruit in an image. 
The same principle applies in large language models. Words and word fragments are mapped to vectors in an embedding space, where words with similar meanings are close to each other, and the directions in the embedding space are sometimes semantically meaningful. There's some incredible, very recent work from the team at Anthropic that shows how sets of activations can be mapped to concepts in language. These results can help us better understand how LLMs work, and can be used to modify model behavior. After clamping a set of activations that correspond to the concept of Golden Gate Bridge to a high value, the LLM the team was experimenting with began to identify itself as the Golden Gate Bridge. AlexNet won the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge by a wide margin in 2012. The third year, the challenge was run. In prior years, the winning teams used approaches that under the hood looked much more like what you might expect to find in an intelligence system. The 2011 winner used a complex set of very different algorithms, starting with an algorithm called SIFT, which is composed of specialized image analysis techniques developed by experts over many years of research. AlexNet, in contrast, is an implementation of a much older AI idea, an artificial neural network, where the behavior of the algorithm is almost entirely learned from data. The dot product operation between the data and a set of weights was originally proposed by McCulloch and Pitts in the 1940s as a dramatically oversimplified model of the neurons in our brain. In the second half of each transformer block in ChatGPT, and at the end of AlexNet, you'll find a multi-layer perceptron. The perceptron is a learning algorithm and physical machine from the 1950s that uses McCulloch and Pitts neurons and can learn to perform basic shape recognition tasks. Back in the 1980s, a younger Jeff Hinton and his collaborators at Carnegie Mellon Watch showed how to train multiple layers of these perceptrons using a multivariate calculus technique called backpropagation. These models were a couple layers deep and remarkably pretty good at driving cars. In the 1990s, Jan LeCun, now chief AI scientist at Meta, was able to train five layer deep models to recognize handwritten digits. Despite the intermittent successes of artificial neural networks over the years, this approach was hardly the accepted way to do AI, right up until the publication of AlexNet. If this was obviously the way to build intelligent systems, we would have done it decades earlier. As Ian Goodfellow writes in his excellent deep learning book, at this point, deep networks were generally believed to be very difficult to train. We now know that algorithms that have existed since the 1980s work quite well, but this was not apparent circa 2006. The issue is perhaps simply that these algorithms are too computationally costly to allow much experimentation with the hardware available at the time. The key difference in 2012 was simply scale of data and scale of compute. The ImageNet dataset was the largest labeled dataset of its kind to date, with over 1.3 million images. And thanks to NVIDIA GPUs, in 2012, Hinton's team had access to roughly 10,000 times more compute power than Jan LeCun had 15 years before. Lacoon's LANET5 model had around 60,000 learnable parameters. AlexNet increased this a thousand-fold to around 60 million parameters. Today, ChatGPT has well over a trillion parameters, making it over 10,000 times larger than AlexNet. This mind-boggling scale is the hallmark of this third wave of AI we find ourselves in today, driving both the performance and the fundamental difficulty in understanding how these models are able to do what they do. It's amazing that we can figure out that AlexNet learns representations of faces, and that large language models learn representations of concepts like the Golden Gate Bridge. But there are many, many more concepts these models learn that we don't even have words for. Activation atlases are beautiful and fascinating, but very low dimensional projections of very high dimensional spaces, where our spatial reasoning abilities often fall apart. It's notoriously difficult to predict where AI will go next. Watch it, Diana, go come Almost try. no one expected the neural networks of the 80s and 90s, scaled up by three or four orders of magnitude, to yield AlexNet. And it was almost impossible to predict that a generalization of the compute blocks in AlexNet, scaled up by four orders of magnitude, would yield ChatGPT. Maybe the next AI breakthrough is just another three to four orders of magnitude of scale away. Or maybe some mostly forgotten approach to AI will resurface as AlexNet did in 2012. We'll have to wait and see. Are you mad that I called the blocks of compute dumb? Mm. Not at all. Describing the compute blocks as dumb highlights the impressive nature of how simple operations can combine to... 
Sorry about that. I had an issue where this thing stopped. Um, anyways, a good water break, but my phone stopped charging. So we're gonna start it up again. I'll go watch another video about machine learning algorithms explained in 17 minutes. So that should give us a couple minutes. So we're at 25 minutes now. We're gonna continue running. Bubbly. The drink of choice. It's healthy. Sparkling water. View of the most important machine learning algorithms to help you decide which one is right for your problem. My name is Tim, and I have been a data scientist for over 10 years and taught all of these algorithms to hundreds of students in real-life machine learning boot camps. There is a simple strategy for picking the right algorithm for your problem. In 17 minutes, you will know how to pick the right one for any problem and get a basic intuition of each algorithm and how they relate to each other. My goal is to give as many of you as possible an intuitive understanding of the major machine learning algorithms to make you stop feeling overwhelmed. According to Wikipedia, machine learning is a field of study in artificial intelligence concerned with the development and study of statistical algorithms that can learn from data and generalize to unseen data and thus perform tasks without explicit instructions. Much of the recent advancements in AI are driven by neural networks, which I hope to give you an intuitive understanding of by the end of this video. Let's divide machine learning into its subfields. Generally, machine learning is divided into two areas, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Supervised learning is when we have a data set with any number of independent variables, also called features or input variables, and a dependent variable, also called target or output variable, that is supposed to be predicted. We have a so-called training data set, where we know the true values for the output variable, also called labels, that we can train our algorithm on to later predict the output variable for new unknown data. Examples could be predicting the price of a house, the output variable based on features of the house, says to footage, location, year of construction, etc. Categorizing an object as a cat or a dog. The output variable or label based on features of the object, say height, weight, size of the ears, color of the eyes, etc. Unsupervised learning is basically any learning problem that is not supervised. So where no truth about the data is known. So where a supervised algorithm would be like showing a little kid what a typical cat looks like and what a typical dog looks like and then giving it a new picture and asking it what animal it sees. An unsupervised algorithm would be giving a kid with no idea of what cats and dogs are, a pile of pictures of animals and asking it to group by similarity without any further instructions. Examples of unsupervised problems might be to sort all of your emails into three unspecified categories, which you can then later inspect and name as you wish. The algorithm will decide on its own how it will create those categories, also called clusters. Let's start with Supervised learn. Dark. Or dark. Say square footage, location, year of construction, etc. Categorizing an object as a cat or a dog. The output variable or label based on features of the object, say height, weight, size of the ears, color of the eyes, etc. Unsupervised learning is basically any learning problem that is not supervised. So where no truth about the data is known. So where a supervised algorithm would be like showing a little kid what a typical cat looks like and what a typical dog looks like, and then giving it a new picture and asking it what animal it sees. An unsupervised algorithm would be giving a kid with no idea of what cats and dogs are, a pile of pictures of animals and asking it to group by similarity without any further instructions. Examples of unsupervised problems might be to sort all of your emails into three unspecified categories, which you can then later inspect and name as you wish. The algorithm will decide on its own how it will create those categories, also called clusters. Let's start with supervised learning arguably the bigger and more important branch of machine learning. There are broadly two subcategories. In regression, we want to predict a continuous numeric target variable for a given input variable. Using the example from before, it could be predicting the price of a house given any number of features of a house and determining their relationship to the final price of the house. We might, for example, find out that square footage is directly proportional to the price, linear dependence, but that the age of the house has no influence on the price of the house. In classification, we try to assign a discrete categorical label, also called a class, to a data point. For example, we may want to assign the label spam or no spam to an email based on its content, sender, and so on. But we could also have more than two classes, for example, junk, primary social promotions and updates, as Gmail does by default. Now let's dive into the actual algorithms, starting with the mother of all machine learning algorithms, linear regression. In general, supervised learning algorithms try to determine the relationship between two variables. We try to find the function that maps one to the other. 
linear regression in its simplest form is trying to determine a linear relationship between two variables, namely the input and the output. We want to fit a linear equation to the data by minimizing the sum of squares of the distances between data points and the regression line. This simply minimizes the average distance of the real data to our predictive model, in this case the regression line, and should therefore minimize prediction errors for new data points. A simple example of a linear relationship might be the height and shoe size of a person, where the regression fit might tell us that for every one unit of shoe size increase, the person will be on average two inches taller. You can make your model more complex and fit multidimensional data to an output variable. In the example of the shoe size, you might, for example, want to include the gender, age, and ethnicity of the person to get an even better model. Many of the very fancy machine learning algorithms, including neural networks, are just extensions of this very simple idea, as I will show you later in the video. Logistic regression is a variant of linear regression and probably the most basic classification algorithm. Instead of fitting a line to two numerical variables with a presumably linear relationship, you now try to predict a categorical output variable using categorical or numerical input variables. Let's look at an example. We now want to predict one of two classes, for example the gender of a person based on height and uh, weight. So a linear regression wouldn't make much sense anymore. Instead of fitting a line to the data, we now fit a so-called sigmoid function to the data, which looks like this. The equation will now not tell us about a linear relationship between two variables, but will now conveniently tell us the probability of a data point falling into a certain class given the value of the input variable. So for example, the likelihood of an adult person with a height of 180 centimeters being a man would be 80%. This is completely made up, of course. The k-nearest neighbors algorithm, or k-n, is a very simple and intuitive algorithm that can be used for both regression and classification. It is a so-called non-parametric algorithm. The name means that we don't try to fit any equations and thus find any parameters of a model. So no true model fitting is necessary. The idea of KNN is simply that for any given new data point, we will predict the target to be the average of its K nearest neighbors. While this might seem very simple, this is actually a very powerful predictive algorithm, especially when relationships are more complicated than a simple linear relationship. In a classification example, we might say that the gender of a person will be the same as the majority of the five people closest in weight and height to the person in question. In a regression example, we might say that the weight of a person is the average weight of the three people closest in height and of chest circumference. This makes a ton of intuitive sense. You might realize that the number three seems a bit arbitrary, and it is. K is called the hyperparameter of the algorithm, and choosing the right K is an art. Choosing a very small number of K, say one or two, will lead to your model predicting your training data set very well, but not generalizing well to unseen data, this is called overfitting. Choosing a very large number, say 1000, will lead to a worse fit overall, this is called underfitting. The best number is somewhere in between and depends a lot on the problem at hand. Methods for finding the right hyperparameters include cross-validation, but are beyond the scope of this video. Support Vector Machine is a supervised machine learning algorithm originally designed for classification tasks, but it can also be used for regression tasks. The core concept of the algorithm is to draw a decision boundary between data points that separates data points of the training set as well as possible. As the name suggests, a new unseen data point will be classified according to where it falls with respect to the decision boundary. Let's take this arbitrary example of trying to classify animals by their weight and the length of their nose. In this simple case of trying to classify cats and elephants, the decision boundary is a straight line. The SVM algorithm tries to find the line that separates the classes with the largest margin possible that is maximizing the space between the different classes. This makes the decision boundary generalized well and less sensitive to noise and outliers in the training data. The so-called support vectors are the data points that sit on the edge of the margin. Knowing the support vectors is enough to classify new data points, which often makes the algorithm very memory efficient. One of the benefits of SVM is that it is very powerful in high dimensions. That is, if the number of features is large, different than that as well as the field. Overall, this is called underfitting. The best number is somewhere in between and depends a lot on the problem at hand. Methods for finding the right hyperparameters include cross-validation, but are beyond the scope of this video. Support Vector Machine is a supervised machine learning algorithm originally designed for classification tasks, but it can also be used for regression tasks. The core concept of the algorithm is to draw a decision boundary between data points that separates data points of the training set as well as possible. As the name suggests, a new unseen data point will be classified according to where it falls with respect to the decision boundary. Let's take this arbitrary example of trying to classify animals by their weight and the length of their nose. In this simple case of trying to classify cats and elephants, the decision boundary is a straight line. The SVM algorithm tries to find the line that separates the classes with the largest margin possible that is maximizing the space between the different classes. This makes the decision boundary generalized well and less sensitive to noise and outliers in the training data. The so-called support vectors are the data points that sit on the edge of the margin. Knowing the support vectors is enough to classify new data points 
which often makes the algorithm very memory efficient. One of the benefits of SVM is that it is very powerful in high dimensions. That is, if the number of features is large compared to the size of the data. In those higher dimensional cases, the decision boundary is called a hyperplane. Another feature that makes SVMs extremely powerful is the use of so-called kernel functions, which allow for the identification of highly complex non-linear decision boundaries. Kernel functions are an implicit way to turn your original features into new, more complex features using the so-called kernel trick, which is beyond the scope of this video. This allows for efficient creation of non-linear decision boundaries by creating complex new features, such as weight divided by height squared, also called the BMI. This is called implicit feature engineering. Neural networks take the idea of implicit feature engineering to the next level, as I will explain later. Possible kernel functions for SVMs are the linear, the polynomial, the RBF, and the sigmoid kernel. Another fairly simple classifier is the naive Bayes classifier that gets its name from Bayes' theorem, which looks like this. I believe it's easiest to understand naive Bayes with an example use case that it is often used for, spam filters. We can train our algorithm with a number of spam and non-spam emails and count the occurrences of different words in each class, and thereby calculate the probability of certain words appearing in spam emails and non-spam emails. The naive classifier is the naive Bayes classifier that gets its name from Bayes' theorem, which looks like this. I believe it's easiest to understand naive Bayes with an example use case that it is often used for, spam filters. We can train our algorithm with a number of spam and non-spam emails and count the occurrences of different words in each class, and thereby calculate the probability of certain words appearing in spam emails and non-spam emails. We can then quickly classify a new email based on the words it contains, but by using Bayes' theorem. We simply multiply the different probabilities of all words in the email together. This algorithm makes the false assumption that the probabilities of the different words appearing are independent of each other, which is why we call this classifier naive. This makes it very computationally efficient while still being a good approximation for many use cases such as spam classification and other text-based classification tasks. Decision trees are the basis of a number of more complex supervised learning algorithms. In its simplest form, a decision tree looks somewhat like this. The decision tree is basically a series of yes-no questions that allow us to partition a data set in several dimensions. Here is an example, decision tree for classifying people into high and low-risk patients for heart attacks. The goal of the decision tree algorithm is to create so-called leaf nodes at the bottom of the tree that are as pure as possible, meaning instead of randomly splitting the data, we try to find splits that lead to the resulting groups, or leaves, to be as pure as possible, which is to say that as few data points as possible are misclassified. While this might seem like a very basic and simple algorithm, which it is, we can turn it into a very powerful algorithm by combining many decision trees together. Combining many simple models to a more powerful complex model is called an ensemble algorithm. One form of ensembling is bagging, where we train multiple models on different subsets of the training data using a method called bootstrapping. A famous version of this idea is called a random forest, where many decision trees vote on the classification of your data by majority vote of the different trees in the random forest. Random forests are very powerful estimators that can be used both for classification and regression. The randomness comes from randomly excluding features for different trees in the forest, which prevents overfitting and makes it much more robust because it removes correlation between the trees. Another type of ensemble method is called boosting, where instead of running many decision trees in parallel like for random forests, we train models in sequence, where each model focuses on fixing the errors made by the previous model. We combine a series of weak models in sequence, thus becoming a strong model, because each sequential model tries to fix the errors of the previous model, boosted trees often get to higher accuracies than random forests, but are also more prone to overfitting. Its sequential nature makes it slower to train than random forests. Famous examples of boosted trees are AdaBoost, Gradient Boosting, and XGBoost the details of which are beyond the scope of this video. Now let's get to the reigning king of AI, neural networks. To understand neural networks, let's look at logistic regression again. Say we have a number of features and are trying to predict a target class. The features might be pixel intensities of a digital image and the target might be classifying the image as one of the digits from zero to nine. Now for this particular case, you might see why this might be difficult to do with logistic regression, because say the number one doesn't look the same when different people write it. And even if the same person writes it several times, it will look slightly different each time and it won't be the exact same pixels illuminated for every instance of the number one. All of the instances of the number one have commonalities. However, like they all have a dominating vertical line and usually no crossing lines as other digits might have. And usually there are no circular shapes in the number one as there would be in the number eight or, or nine. However, the computer doesn't initially know about these more complex features, but only the pixel intensities. We could manually engineer these features by measuring some of these things and explicitly adding them as new features. But artificial neural networks, similarly to using a kernel function with a support vector machine, are designed to implicitly and automatically design these features for us, without any guidance from humans. 
We do this by adding additional layers of unknown variables between the input and output variables. In its simplest form, this is called a single layer perceptron, which is basically just a multi-feature regression task. Now if we add a hidden layer, the hidden variables in the middle layer represent some hidden unknown features, and instead of predicting the target variable directly, we try to predict these hidden features with our input features, and then try to predict the target variables with our new hidden features. In our specific example, we might be able to say that every time several pixels are illuminated next to each other, they represent a horizontal line, which can be a new feature to try and predict the digit in question, even though we never explicitly defined a feature called horizontal line. This is a much simplified view of what is actually going on, but hopefully this gets the point across. We don't usually know what the hidden features represent, we just train the neural network to predict the final target as well as possible. The hidden features we can design this way are limited in the case of the single hidden layer. But what if we add a layer and have the hidden layer predict another hidden layer? What if we now had even more layers? This is called deep learning and can result in very complex hidden features so that might represent all kinds of complex information in the pictures, like the fact that there is a face in the picture. However, we will usually not know what the hidden features mean, we just know that they result in good predictions. All we have talked about so far is supervised learning, where we wanted to predict a specific target variable using some input variables. However, sometimes we don't have anything specific to predict and just want to find some underlying structure in our data. That's where unsupervised learning comes in. A very common unsupervised problem is clustering. It's easy to confuse clustering with classification, but they are conceptually very different. Classification is when we know the classes we want to predict and have training data with true labels available, shown as colors here, like pictures of cats and dogs. Clustering is when we don't have any labels and want to find unknown clusters just by looking at the overall structure of the data and trying to find potential clusters in the data. For example, we might look at a two-dimensional data set that looks like this. Any human will probably easily see three clusters here. But it's not always as straightforward as your data might also look like this. We don't know how many clusters there are because the problem is unsupervised. The most famous clustering algorithm is called k-means clustering. Just like for KNN, K is a hyperparameter and stands for the number of clusters you are looking for. Finding the right number of clusters again is an art and has a lot to do with your specific problem and some trial and error and domain knowledge might be required. This is beyond the scope of this video. K means is very simple. You start by randomly selecting centers for your K clusters and assigning all data points to the cluster center closest to them. The clusters here are shown in blue and green. You then recalculate the cluster centers based on the data points now assigned to them. You can see the centers moving closer to the actual clusters. You then assign the data points again to the new cluster centers, followed by recalculating the cluster centers. You repeat this process until the centers of the clusters have stabilized. While k-means is the most famous and most common clustering algorithm, other algorithms exist, including some where you don't need to specify the number of clusters, like hierarchical clustering and dbscan, which can find clusters of arbitrary shape, but I won't discuss them here. The last type of algorithm I will leave you with is dimensionality reduction. The idea of dimensionality reduction is to reduce the number of features or dimensions of your data set, keeping as much information as possible. Usually this group of algorithms does this by finding correlations between existing features and removing potentially redundant dimensions without losing much information. For example, do you really need a picture in high resolution to recognize the airplane in the picture, or can you reduce the number of pixels in the image? As such, dimensionality reduction will give you information about the relationships within your existing features, and it can also be used as a pre-processing step in your supervised learning algorithm to reduce the number of features in your dataset and make the algorithm more efficient and robust. An example algorithm is principal component analysis, or PCA. Let's say we are trying to predict types of fish based on several features like length, height, color, and number of teeth. When looking at the correlations of the different features, we might find that height and length are strongly correlated and including both won't help the algorithm much and might in fact hurt it by introducing noise. We can simply include a shape feature that is a combination of the two. This is actually extremely common in large datasets and allows us to reduce the number of features dramatically and still get good results. PCA does this by finding the directions in which most variance in the dataset is retained. In this example, the direction of most variance is a diagonal this is called the first principal component, or PC, and can become our new shape feature. The second principal component is orthogonal to the first and only explains a small fraction of the variance of the dataset and can thus be excluded from our dataset in this case. In large datasets, we can do this for all features and rank them by explained variance and exclude any principal components that don't contribute much to the variance and thus wouldn't help much in our ML model. This was all common machine learning algorithms explained. If you are overwhelmed and don't know which algorithm you need, here is a great cheat sheet by scikit-learn that will help you decide which algorithm is right for which type of problem. If you want a roadmap on how to learn machine learning, check out my video on that. Nice, that was cool. 
actually have. You are currently watching a neural network learn. Ah. Yeah, so you have um, two types of machine learning. You have supervised and unsupervised. Supervised is when you want to, you have labeled data that you want to classify. Unsupervised is when you don't have labeled data. You have some different forms of the algorithm on the supervised that are broken down into. Classification and regression. Regression is when you want to get a continuous value, meaning a decimal value. And classification is when it's about getting classified values like labeled text, for example. We have different how you have logistic regression, which builds up linear regression. KNN, which is nearest number, nearest neighbor algorithm. So, like three, they classify based on the three nearest values. You classify what that is. So, if there are three cats around it that look alike, you're going to be a cat. Or the closest things that map to the values around you are cats, then you're going to be a cat. Uh, unsupervised learning now uh, about clustering data. So you have like a 2D space, you have multiple values, red and blue values. You try to form a cluster around a group of data and you do it in an unsupervised way so you don't really know what the labels mean. We're trying to draw a correlation between those multiple data points. That is cool. Thanks. I'll save that video. If you're just getting into machine learning, the number of research papers can get overwhelming, or at least this was my experience when I was first getting started. At this stage, you don't actually need to make research papers your main focus. The best use of time would be mastering the basics, like linear regression, gradient descent, and neural networks. If you're interested, I have videos on all three of those topics linked in the description, each with a multiple choice quiz as well. But after you get the basics down, reading papers is essential. Papers aren't just for researchers. In many big tech companies, engineers are also expected to read papers, and stay up to date on the latest theory. I've interviewed That's why I'm here. Tech as an engineer, and my team actually had me Everybody read the papers that were relevant to our team. work. The bottom See, line, the papers are worth the time investment, but it would be impossible to read See, every what's paper. What's so here's yes. a spot of them that I consider actually absolutely essential. Let's get started. At number five on our list, we have attention is all you need, which you may have already expected to be on the list. It's one of the most talked about papers in machine learning, and this list wouldn't be complete without it. This paper proposed the transformer architecture behind Google Translate and, of course, GPT. Sure, there's tons of resources out there to learn about transformers and attention, but I still think this paper is worth reading to understand the historical context behind the development of transformers. The authors of the paper actually developed the transformer to improve translation neural networks, not chatbots. At number four on our list, we have handwritten digit recognition with a back propagation network. It's from 1989, and this was actually the first paper where convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, were trained with deep learning methods. The first author is Yan Lacoon, a chief AI scientist at Meta, who's also considered the godfather of CNNs. Given that CNNs are widely used across almost every image classification model today, understanding the ideas of the inventors in their own words is definitely worth the time investment. Number three on our list is one of my favorite papers, An Image is Worth 16 by 16 Words, another paper from Google. The central idea of this paper is that if we train a large enough model on a large enough dataset, transformers can actually outperform CNNs at image classification. Yup, transformers can be used for models other than chatbots. The trickiness in this paper lies in how we can represent an image as a sequence to pass into the transformer. You can't just pass each individual pixel in, since the sequence would be way too long when dealing with high resolution images. I'll leave it to you to read about the trick, or if you're interested in a video breaking down the vision transformer, just leave a comment. 
At number two, I argue that everyone should read the Laura Blow Rank Adaptation of LLMs. This paper dives into a matrix multiplication trick that can be used to fine-tune LLMs without any expensive GPUs. It's actually inspired an entire subreddit, r slash local llama, for ML enthusiasts fine-tune models on interesting and unique datasets. I think this paper is worth reading to understand how fine-tuning actually works since the box of libraries will obstruct away these important details. Finally, an exciting paper dives into a matrix multiplication trick that can be used to function via a convincing log when dealing with high-resolution images. I'll leave it to you to read about the trick, or if you're interested in a video breaking down the vision transformer, just leave a comment. At number two, I argue that everyone should read the LoRa low rank adaptation of LLMs. This paper dives into a matrix multiplication trick that can be used to fine-tune LLMs without any expensive GPUs. It's actually inspired an entire subreddit, r slash local llama, for ML enthusiasts fine-tuned models on interesting and unique datasets. I think this paper is worth reading to understand how fine-tuning actually works since a lot of the libraries will abstract away these important details. Finally, at number one on our list, I think everyone should read the original paper on the RAG from 2020. It's titled, Retrieval Augmented Generation for Knowledge Intensive NLP Tasks, a mouthful. This paper comes from Facebook AI and dives into how RAG really works, from similarity search to embedding models and vector databases. RAG isn't going anywhere anytime soon, so I think everyone should understand the neural networks behind this incredibly useful tool. Hope you found this video useful, and let me know in the comments if there's any specific papers you're interested in. See you soon. Okay, I think that's it for me and the videos. This is an activations atlas. It gives us a glimpse. So we did three videos. Alex Netwa, the 17 National Nugget is the normal one. And that last one about some papers that you can read to learn more about the various developments in there. Ah. Anyways, yeah, we're here, we're pushing. I realize that I'm going a lot faster than I normally go, but my heartbeat is in zone three, which is the target zone. It's not running too hot. I'm sweating, oh my gosh, this is dusty. Um, we have eight minutes left, seven minutes left. I'm going to 3.8 miles per hour, which is, how much is that? Five point seven kilometers per hour. Three point. It's kind of going at two to three point equals to five point eight kilometers per hour. And the other Yeah. Uh -huh. Mass per hour to kilometer per hour. This is x times 1.6 equal the kmh value. Speed and it is well, five minutes left. Yeah, but we're doing it, we're doing it, we're doing it right.
Oh no, I'm going above the door tree. Slow down. Oh, I'm getting a car. Hey y'all, uh, sorry about that. Last five minutes anyways, five, 55 minutes gone. Last five minutes, wifey was calling me. Um, I'll be back. But yeah, we're putting in the work, man. I'm for putting in the work. Actually, last four and a half minutes. We're doing the right thing, y'all. We're out here doing the right thing. We're pushing, keeping ourselves busy, We're working hard. You know what I mean? But anyways, this is. I'm very happy that I know that during the winter, I have a thing I can do. Ask me any questions you want to ask me out of the chat. We here. We're living it up. Trying to stay fit and fun. Fit and fun. Two and a half minutes left. After this, I'm gonna get a bowl of fresh, a nice bath. Jump in bed. One minute left, y'all. Remember, keep fighting, keep pushing, keep winning. We outside, we in at them. Home town. They are easy back, you know. Thirty second left, y'all. Whenever you feel like you want to give up on your little goals, just remember to start it. One minute starting. Even when you feel down. Today I feel really down. But I'm very happy at the end of this. At the day, I'm able to just push through and get my steps in. Right now I'm at zone 3. What is around 46 degrees? I mean, BPM. And uh, do the thing the way how we said we want to do it. 
So we're just going to warm down, cool down. Uh, very happy for this thing. The winters can really get you, especially if you don't go gym or have a gym membership. Can really get you done. Over there still. I'm yucky. That means I put in some work. Over there. Stay up on the goalie, sir. Come on, no. Where to find me? Peace out.